Attica State, John Lennon here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to a look at a new documentary about a man once described as the most hated and most loved lawyer in America, the late William M. Kunstler. He is the subject of a new documentary directed and produced by his daughters, Emily and Sarah Kunstler. Growing up, it seemed like my father was at the center of everything important that had ever happened. He fought for civil rights with Martin Luther King Jr. and represented activists protesting the Vietnam War. When the inmates took over Attica prison or Native Americans stood up to the federal government at Wounded Knee, they asked my father to be their lawyer. When he spoke about his past, he was like a hero from legend. His clients were fighting to change the world, and Dad was fighting to keep them out of jail. My sister and I weren't around for our father's glory days. Sarah was born in 1976, when Dad was 57. I came along two years later. An excerpt from the new documentary, William Kunstler, Disturbing the Universe, narrated by his daughter, Emily Kunstler. The film opens on Friday at Cinema Village in New York. The film's directors, Emily and Sarah Kunstler, join us here in our Firehouse studio. They're the founders of Off Center Media, a documentary production company that exposes injustice in the criminal justice system. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, tell us about what made you decide to do this film about your famous father. Well, you know, Sarah and I got to a point in our lives in our late 20s when we thought it was the right time to look back and think about legacy and our influence. Um, and it seemed natural to investigate the choices that our father had made. Talk a little, Sarah, about your father. Uh, you too went the route of, uh, well, training to be a lawyer, though you decided to go into film. Yeah, well, I actually, I, I, I do also practice criminal law. Um, our, our, our father was uh, around, well, it seemed when we were children that he was at the center of everything important that had ever happened. He worked with Martin Luther King, Jr. He uh, defended Freedom Riders, the Chicago Eight, the, the inmates at Attica Prison, the American Indian Movement at Wounded Knee. He just seemed to be everywhere. And those were our bedtime stories, this kind of heroic past that our father had led. And when we were children, uh, he spent most of his time close to home in New York doing criminal cases and representing people accused of violent crime. So the decision to actually go, because there have been, there've been some films that have, have been made of him, the decision to make this personal story, uh, uh, how did you reach that? Uh, well, you know, I, I think that it was, it was a, a, a part of an investigation that Emily and I had to go through any, anyway. He passed away when we were teenagers, and that kind of arrested our relationship. We didn't get to kind of sit across a table with him and see him as an adult and a, and a, and a flawed person and a human being and say, you know, I'm okay with you, you're okay with me, the kind of, I think, the natural progression that happens with parents as we get older. So the film was a way for us to do that. It was a way for us to look at his life and to see what we take from him. Emily, uh Chronicle your father's life for us briefly. Talk about those cases that you've just referenced, but maybe people, especially young people, aren't even familiar with. How your father rose to prominence and the cases he took on. Well, you know, he started his, his career as a movement lawyer um, in the South, representing the Freedom Riders. And um, they were... The Freedom Riders would ride uh, buses across state lines and try to integrate um, the, the uh, lunch counters at different um, bus stations across the country and risk arrest. And this was a real, um, seeing the Freedom Riders uh, risk arrest and brutality uh, really had a big influence on, on our father. It made him realize that it was the action that really had meaning, that you could sit around and talk all you want but that it was really putting your being willing to put your life on the line that made a difference. So that really changed the course of his life. And then after that, he went on to represent people protesting the war in Vietnam, um, the, the, the Berrigan brothers in the Catonsville Nine when they burned uh, uh, draft cards with napalm. And then um, he's most famous for his defense of the Chicago Eight um, and then the Chicago Seven, ultimately. Um, after they uh, were arrested for protesting the Democratic National Convention in 1968. So that really brought him to, to, to 
national prominence. I, I wanted to go back to the film William Kunstler Disturbing the Universe and play an excerpt that deals with one of the most controversial cases your father, William Kunstler, took on in the 1980s. When I was 10 years old, I remember pleading with him not to represent a teenager accused of a gang rape. But once his mind was made up, nobody could stop him. Central Park Jogger case was a case in which a white a female was beaten severely uh, in Central Park. And uh, the, there were a number of young uh, a black a youth who were arrested. The defendants were not that much older than me or Sarah, but it felt like worlds apart. They were black kids from under 10th Street. And I mean, they were perfect. Throw them away. I mean, well, what is it? of course they did it. A pack of youths out on a night of wilding, savagely beat and rape a, a helpless young jogger. Uh, they're all arrested. They're called a wolf pack. And everybody hates these kids, and they confess. And the atmosphere in the city was these guys are dead guilty before trial. Donald Trump had put a full-page ad in the Times saying they should get the death penalty. To understand is to forgive. I don't want to understand what motivates uh, someone uh, to engage in this kind of horror. I want, rather than to understand him, I want him punished. May it please the court, my name is William Kunstler, and I am arguing for Yusef Salam. This is the first of the so-called Central Park Jogger cases. And we have three issues. Yusef Salam became his obsession. For two years, Dad wrote appeal after appeal, and finally lost when New York's highest court affirmed the conviction. I was mad at him for taking this case. An excerpt from the documentary William Kunstler Disturbing the Universe. Well, Bill Kunstler died in 1995 at the age of 76. Seven years after his death, there was a startling development in the Central Park Jogger case. You may remember a famous case here in New York. It was called the Central Park Jogger Attack. And back in 1989, it stunned this city, the nation really, and resulted in the arrests of five teenagers. Now it turns out they apparently got the wrong guys. And today, New York prosecutors moved to have all the guilty verdicts set aside. Youssef Salam spent seven years in prison and was exonerated in 2002. I was, I was that person who was the worst person that ever lived, who needed to be disposed of. People wanted us to be hanging from the tree by the end of the day. To me, the, the, the trial wasn't just in the courtroom. The trial was also on the train going to the courtroom. It was walking around my neighborhood on the weekends. It was walking around anywhere, you know, and I was very recognizable. I was always on trial. I think Dad always believed in Yousef's innocence. But I've realized it was never about innocence for Dad. He looked at Yousef and saw a kid who had been convicted by public opinion and by his own daughters before the case ever went to trial. The legacy that Bill Kunstler has left is his fights and his struggles were, or became also my fights and my struggles. You know, anytime you have injustice or, or anytime you're faced with any kind of injustice and you're in a position to do something, you have to do something. I remember my father telling us that all white people are racist, including me and Sarah. But I didn't understand what he meant at the time. He meant that we are blind to the depth of our own prejudice, and that as long as there is prejudice, there can be no such thing as a fair trial. And that's the terrible myth of organized society, that everything that's done through the established system is legal, and that word has a powerful psychological impact. It makes people believe 
that there is an order to life and an order to a system and that a person that goes through this order and is convicted has gotten all that is due him and therefore society can turn its conscience off and look to other things and other times and that's the terrible thing about these past trials is that they have this aura of legitimacy this aura of legality i suspect that better men than the world has known and more of them have gone to their death through a legal system than through all the illegalities in the history of man.